Uh, okay, I lied. Willie's not coming. I apologize for that. Uh, this is a presentation I put together. Yeah, I know. There's always one. Uh, this is a presentation I put together about uh, the actual process, the process of the process, and what's going to happen in the introduction. So we've got two, three, four, five. So uh, my name is James. I'm an ImageX. We are also in Vancouver, Canada. It's a home office, and I'm the LA office. Uh, who do we have here? Tell me your name. Uh, Jack Walfield with the City of Wuhan. Yeah, cool. Alan Lauer. Where, where is that? Where are we? Huh? Where's that? Yeah, we're cool. We need to find him back. We need to find back John. Do it all. Paul, I know you, Paul Man. Hello, welcome. Tell me your name. Zach. Zach. I love how you say that such time. Oh, yeah, I'll say what you're failing to thank you. The solid mustache in the presentation is what I got from this. Well, this is going to be serious. I, I left the wax, so I do do something. Uh, this is always a big hit. Uh, Zach, what do you do? Uh, I run I go plus one of those launch Oh, cool. Where is that? LA and Phoenix. Thanks, Rainy, thank you for joining us. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. Tell me who your friend is. Bridget. Bridget, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Good on James. Nice to meet you. So, do you work with Randy? I do. I've been training for about a month. I work with Randy. Ah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've done that a few times. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, what's your name? Hi, I'm Bridget. I work at IPS International. Kelly? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Where is ICS? Uh, Oh, that's that. Candor Billy's my favorite. Hi uh, there. Yeah. So I'm Melvin McFarland. I'm a couple of days. I'm a grad student. So we're in uh, AI and data basing. So I'm going to be able to focus. And I'm also the founder of a startup called AlanClub.com. And it's a website that uh, how to create and store motion insights. And it's a great platform in terms of uh, content in terms of basically uh, paying attention to what's noise and what's signal and uh, it's basically what it does. It's a unsupervised learning eventually after it gets to know the user and it's uh, cool. Cool. Well, let's take another day. We've been on uh, signal versus noise. Hello? Yeah. Uh, all right. Can we leave the signal on? Get them your name. Jill. Jill. You told me on the internet to write it down. Very much. With the uh, cool Kiara tattoo. Sorry, I had to have you in my show. Hello, sir. Thank you for joining us. Hi. 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 I'm a lady over from the Minnesota Park. Lady, thank you for joining us. Where is that? It's in Okay. Thank you very much. Let's set this up and make our presentation a little more active. Appreciate you taking the time. Time to reorder my stuff. Reorder my stuff. All right. Um, you guys may have heard of the Peter Principle. The Peter Principle says that people are promoted to the level of their inequity or inability. Uh, he had another saying, if you don't know where you're going, okay, any road will get you there. So we're going to talk a little bit about understanding, putting a frame around the process, and the idea of, of helping us to do that in a way to make sure we make progress we want to make. The presentation yesterday by Susan Rust, I don't know if you guys know Susan. Um, she does a great presentation called you know, Ugly Babies and, and, and uh, uh, Train Wrecks. Yeah, Train Wrecks. Come on, you guys. Uh, just come on, guys. I don't know if you your name. Michael. Michael, thank you. So you, you guys see now there will be a pop quiz later. That's why you know your name. So study it. So our big goals here in uh, project management, we want client satisfaction, and the way you get client sa satisfaction is through quality work, keeping them happy, and we want progress. And in this presentation, I'm going to talk about using an analytic process to try and achieve this process. 
Uh, I won't be offended if you guys are looking at your phone or tweeting or any of that while we're, while we're going, so feel free. Um, let me know if you want to take a picture and I will smile. Part of, the, part of the process we're dealing with is that this is the classic thing. Uh, Susan gives us as a triangle, I, I use this, the circle, the three things we're balancing. Cost, scope, schedule. Features, scope. Cost, budget, schedule. Uh, some people will include schedule as a budget because budget really is both time and money. And time, as Benjamin Franklin will tell you, is money. So these are two of the same things. In business school, they said in the American environment, pick two high, uh, high quality, low cost, fast turnaround. Which two do you want out of the three? Which is very common in the American market. That's how you can Hi, welcome. Tell me your name. Jen. Jen, thank you. I appreciate it. You just got Jill off the hook, so you have to be the same line. Now it's going to be you, buddy. All right, so you, you can't really, you can tell clients that, they will pick two. You're going to annoy them right off the bat. Basically, the way Susan puts it is in the area here, total, uh, that's why she uses the drive. If the area has to remain the same and you need more features, then you either have to give me more budget or more time. Because you, you change one of these things. If you need it faster, then I have to add more resources to it. I'm going to consume the budget faster. So you know, again, I, I can. It, there's got to be a give and take to keep these three three things in balance. Communicating this with your client, keeping this in front of them, helps to avoid conflict, helps keep them happy, which is one of the first things we talked about. Who here knows what agile is? Agile is a big thing, and all right. Smaller set of hands, who here doesn't know what Apple is? And you're outstanding, I guess. <laughs> All right, Apple is a production methodology that is recently in vogue, and it's the antithesis to waterfall, which was the traditional method. Agile comes from extreme programming, where a bunch of guys sat around and said, okay, look, the way we used to do this, computer programming came out of the engineering department, and engineers did waterfall, where you talk about the project, what you need, what's gonna happen, how are we going to do it? What are your needs? How are we going to build it? And we're going to put all this on the paper. And we're going to plan, we're going to plan, we're going to plan, we're going to plan. And then we're going to start. So I've consumed a third of your budget before I've done anything. And I've made estimates at the time when I know the least about what's going to happen. I've estimated the same things up to 18 months, 24 months down the road. And there have been consequences for that. The computer engineer guy said, you know, by the time you finish all that paperwork, I can program this. We sat around in class going, you want me to write it down and make a diagram for you for, for a simple person? By the time I know that, I could have written it. It could be done. So extreme programming said, we're not going to do that. We're going to start programming. And they developed this method called Agile. And these are some of the, they have a manifesto online. You can read it. These are some of them. However, that's software. Web pages are like software, but they are not software. Web pages exist. You can reach out and touch it with your computer, Google Serial. So it's going to have characteristics that are both software like and real like in terms of building something. So when I make a change to something that's purely software that says, I want a piece of software that'll balance my checkbook. Let me get data in, let me get data out. It's that simple. I want to change that. All I have to do is input a subroutine, input a piece of code. I can easily insert that. When you tell me I want the menu on the web page to go from mega menu to super fish, uh, that's a lot to, to rip out, put back in, because it's related to everything you tell me. I want the, the footer to change. Now we're talking about construction, things that, that, that are not as simple as, sure, I'll throw in a server team. And today it's done. It's going to be a, lot, a, little, a little more difficult. So, we want Agile to help us make clients happy and have quality work. This is one of the things I was highlighting in the last session, which is, uh, again, noise versus signal. When you have conflicts with, with your client, when you have conflicts in any relationship, there's a gap. That gap is the difference between expectations and reality. When expectations exceed reality, we're happy. You know, I got twice as much tax refund as I thought I was going to get. Bonus, I'm happy about that. When it matches reality, again, I'm happy and not overly happy and not you know, surprised by that, uh, but no problem. When reality is below my expectations, now I have a problem. 
So as soon as you can see a conflict in a process, manage that gap. As soon as you can see that gap, start to alert your client. Something's happened and I will not make delivery date because one of my developers got flu and he needed everybody else. So five guys are out, I'm down resources. There's nothing I can do. And you know, the alternatives are trying to find substitutes, bring them in, bring them up to speed, which is inefficient and won't help and be wasteful. So if there's no way for these guys to get back, I'm very sorry. But you've told them that before the event happens that you're late, because you know it's going to be late. You, you can tell them there's a risk. And my guys are out, and when they come back, they're going to try and make up the time. But there's a good chance we're going to be delayed. And I want to make you aware of that now so that there's not a sticker shock when reality does not match expectations. I want to adjust your expectations to fix this gap, to fix conflict before it happens. To keep clients happy. Because clients are very good at saying, it's my money, do what I want, make me happy, I'm not happy, and put massive amounts of pressure on them. You want to keep them happy, you want to keep them coming back. Here's that gap. This is where it is. Always looking for, are we going to meet expectations? Remember that circle? Cost, budget, you know, the budget, features, the delivery time. When any of those things are changing, you're going to have a gap. Make sure you want to keep that kind of on a dashboard between yourself and your client, between yourself and your team. You want your team, you want to train your team to be able to tell you this as well. Make it part of your culture. Bring them into the sense of local conversation. Say, okay, you, know, you need to tell me you suddenly we were on a project that was going to take a year and and, and the rain is, is here to give us a great example. You have a, a new addition to the family that is that are going to happen. Okay, that's going to happen sooner than a year. And it's going to affect your availability and affect how to manage projects. So, rain is managed to have by training someone to take over for us. And again, this is the kind of thing that sooner or later is going to be obvious. So that problem you know, is, is easier to see. But train your team. Tell me. Something's going on. You know, yes, it's personal to tell me that your mom's in the hospital and you're worried and kind of serious. But that may mean that you need to suddenly and unexpectedly leave for things that are very, very understandable. But you can bring that into level of conversation. You can make it okay. You can create an environment that, that says we can handle this simply with business. We can, we can create confidence to come in with, with, with an issue and work the problem rather than, than make a new one by going, oh my God, you're going to be out. Like there's going to be all these problems. You've created a culture where you're punishing Clear communication. And the whole point of Agile is trying to, to grab those clear communications and grab that clear communication out of that ambiguity. You walk in with Agile, you can tell clients we're going to start a carding exercise. The cars are, are ubiquitous in Agile. And they don't have to know. They don't have to have all that crazy paperwork. They start telling me the ideas. Tell me your user stories. Tell me what you want the site to do. And you start putting that up on the wall. And before you know it, you get clusters of data. You see, all these things are related. All these things are related. And this tells you information. Now, we see a path. We see a theme that we can go down. You have used ambiguity to start with to narrow down into specifics to sort of address specific pain points that may not even have been known or be able to be articulated before you started that process. Many clients, nobody knows what they don't know. And many clients haven't built a website ever, but the last time was five years ago. So they're not good at it. You and I do it every day. We're used to the vocabulary. We're used to eating the dog food. We're used to the, the, the hazards. We, we understand what's going to happen when you do X, Y, and Z. We understand that that's harder than that. They don't. We understand very specifically with the, what we mean by the things we say. The client doesn't. If we assume that they do, and, then, and they don't know that they don't. And they say, oh yeah, that sounds good. They don't know that they agree with something they don't understand. And you don't either because you've lost them. So here's a, you know, one, one of my examples. Difference between reality and expectations. Uh, this was me in undergrad, so I was not Johnny Knoxville. Yeah, by the time I got to graduate school, I was much better. So we want clear communications in order to make the project successful, establish a long-term relationship, and deliver what we promised. So without doing all of that pre-work, all of the waterfall style, 
months and months of paperwork. We start off in the app process. We're going to start with a blank wall, a bunch of cards, tell me the user stories, and we're going to see the statistical clumps that show up. And from those statistical clumps, it's a, you know, the things with the largest number of data points are going to be obviously the most important to you. But you can also ask, okay, this is what has shown up through this process. That doesn't mean that I'm going to assume the process is perfect. What's missing? Now that you've given them, you present their client with an opportunity and vehicle to look at it visually, and they say, okay, user can come to the site and search. User can log in. User can have their own account. User can find their degree program. User can find their college. Um, no one said user can pay tuition. That's really important to me. I wanted that, that to be added there, to, to have that ability. And somehow, that just didn't come up in the conversation. So you can have to add that in. We talked about this in the last session, this is the communication process. Corey's ready to tell us all that. See, I told you to be about this. Please look for this when you have a chance later I'm going to push my deck. This is the most complete diagram of this model I've, I've found, and I really like it. Understand, in any communication event, me talking to you right now, there are five steps. And in between so those five steps, noise will enter the process. The difference between my understanding and common usage of a definition of a word in yours is noise in the process. The, the fan here making noise itself, which means your, your ability to hear clearly, is noise in the process. On a website, that channel there in the middle, uh, are you addressing the same receptacle frame of your audience that you think you are? Uh, that's noise in the process. Those are things you want to take out. That happens everywhere, in every communication event. With you, your, with your client, your team, your boss, and your web page with its audience. So, the uh, uh, that perceptual frame is the thing you want to align. That's why you're taking the time to put those cards on the wall. When you look uh, with, with Ajax and higher, uh, we do higher education websites. One of the one of the diagrams you see on the web that goes around as a joke. They do this Venn diagram that says. We asked administrators of universities, what's important on the website? We got all this information, and it was degree programs, name of the college, location of the college, pay tuition. We asked students, what's important on the website? And they said, where to get beer, where to get pizza, name of the college, degree program. And when you find the overlap, the two things, the only two things that are overlap, name the school, degrees. Administrators think, we want the site to do this, this, and this, and that serves our audience. And you can come in and say, let's evaluate that. We've got the cards on the wall. These are the things you want the site to do. Is that effective? Is that getting to the channel? Or is there noise in the process? Is that why you're not getting the conversion that you want? You're not getting the buy. In, the, in marketing, you have three steps. Awareness, education, buy. -in. That process is fundamental to any communication process. If I'm trying to convert you to these ideas, I'm going to go through that same process. I'm going to make you aware of a presentation of this set of ideas that we did on the website right here. I'm going to educate you on these ideas right now. And I'm going to try and do it in a way that you go, yeah, that makes sense. Buy it. You haven't spent any money, which is fine, but it's still the same buying. When I talk to the people I supervise, I say, I really need to get this done and this done. And we've got a problem with the schedule. We're open for a Saturday, and I need you to buy in and be able to do that. Or we say, part of the company culture is, is suffering because we're missing problems. We're not hearing the idea that there's someone is sitting on an idea in the back of the room, and, and they've seen a problem, and they haven't raised the red flag. So as a culture, we, we've got to raise that up to the level of conversation in front of the We've got to open that space up. I need buy-in. I need to give them confidence, awareness, education, buy-in. So I'm making them aware of this. I'm trying to educate them on it. I'm trying to achieve that buy-in. So you see the same three things in conversation, in sales, in, in a website. You want the audience of your website to come back for more. So does your client. Noise in the process. Troy seen this one before. This is my favorite. Noise in the process means this. You're, you're telling your buddy, you're helping them back up the truck, 
Let's pick up the garbage, pick up something. Come on back, come on back. Crunch! That's good! <laughs> there was some noise in the process. He didn't hear you say stop. So he's backed his truck up into your garage. Noise in the process isn't just that one event. And that's fun for me to make as a joke in this example. Noise in the process happens one drop at a time, and he's added to that perceptual frame in the previous diagram. Every time you tell your client, no, I can't do that. Uh, you have to find a way to say no without saying no. They added their frame. This guy's difficult to work with. I don't get what I want. I'm not happy. I'm adding things to my perceptual frame that are distancing me from the relationship, that are distancing me from a happy outcome. Look for the noise in the process. Remember, again, the diagram, there are five steps between my brain and yours to communicate an idea. Just the words coming out of my mouth right now. There's an idea that I translate into an abstraction called language that I then communicate, put into the channel by speaking, that you hear, that you detranslate into another idea. My brain yours, five steps. In between each of those, noise and people. It can be physical noise, which interferes with your ability to hear it. It can be that perceptual frame, the noise in your own head, in your client's head, the things they understand and don't understand, or don't understand that they don't understand, and will say, yeah, that sounds good. Clients don't understand why you're framing things up. One time we sent clients, we, we tried to give them richer wireframes to make them a nice PDF. This, this is what this page is going to look like. And they wrote us back saying, none of the buttons work. I tried clicking them, they just don't work. Noise in the process. The idea didn't get through. And they said, yeah, I understand. Well, they didn't understand the difference between a live website and a PDF. And like everyone else, they didn't know what they don't know until you discover it. That's, that is the pitfall for all of us. How many people would be surprised? Uh, who could tell me how much of the communication is actually the words you use? How many people think it's 90% is the words? No one's going to buy me in 90%. 50%? Anyone 50%? How about 25? 25% of the message communicated is the words. Rain, I'm almost talking rain into it. <laughs> Kelly? Not Rick? All right. How many of you would be surprised to see this? Less than 7% of the message communicated is the words you use, the words I know I'm not right now. More is my body language, my tone, something is nice, and then he's angry. And you hear it instantly. Just the raising of my voice right then. You have a physical response to that. Because it wasn't just raising my voice with the, with the volume like I am now, but it had that angry tone. You respond to that. We are wired for this. Because we, are, we existed as animals without formal language far longer than we have with it. Language is an abstraction of culture. You are born without language, and you learn it. But you are born with the ability to communicate. Adults around you will struggle very hard with, okay, what do you want? You hungry? Okay. Are you diabetes? What, what, what do you need? Um, and infants learn to work with adults. You watch infants looking very carefully around, going, okay, who can I work with paying attention? Because they are also wired to understand their survival depends on their ability to make you aware and educate you and get the body in to give them what they need, or they do not survive. If they're abandoned as a troop of apes and there's only along a plane, they, they can't survive their own. So it's, it's part of how they're wired to endear themselves to the adults around them who can ensure their survival. Watch them, they, they will amaze you when you, when you see this as a successful friend and frame this behavior that way, you suddenly see it. It's stunning. So here's going to be some of the differences between waterfall and Waterfall, a long planning session, everything at once, and I don't have any time until the very end to make adjustments. Agile says, I'm not going to try to make estimates now of things that are that far in the future. It doesn't make any sense. I might have to get that wrong. I'm trying to say that I'm going to leverage my knowledge and say, yes, in 18 months, this will take me that much time. What did happen to me? Or anything that you made in that, that amount of time. Um, so you, you put a lot on this. Agile says, let's do things small. I want a, a short time horizon, two weeks, three weeks. Tell me what you can get in that amount of time. And if that rational, that reasonable, we're going to review that. We're going to be constantly paying attention to it to manage the gap, to get that circle in front of the client with the cost, time, scope. And 
and each point we can make an adjustment. And you get the ability to suss out all of a sudden the client has a chance to address, oh, I didn't know what I didn't know. There's an unintended consequence here. When I ask you for students to be able to pay their tuition online, and I put the numbers up there, I scared the hell out of them. When, when they realized it was $10,000 per semester hour to attend Harvard, half of them abandoned the site. I see the balance rate on my Google Analytics. So I, I don't want to do that. I'm not being successful with, with my communication channel. When I started to get to the education part, I lost the chance to get the buy-in. So I've got to adjust the message. I have sure the noise into the process that I want to take out to achieve better flow, awareness, education, life. So you get a chance to make an adjustment. You make sure the client every couple of weeks, you do what you meant. Does this look like what you want to do? Does this do what you want to do? Does this service me? Is this a present good thing? Is this what we see? And here's the catch. You have a project manager who is shepherding a team in agile you want senior people who are responsible to each other as a team. So the project manager, I'm stepping out. He's saying, you have to answer to Corey, and he has to answer to you. And if you're not giving him what he needs in terms of code and the handoff, then he's lost. So two, you gotta work that out, and as senior people, I expect you to be able to work it out, and you can't come to me. But at the same time, you're working off a small list. I'm not trying to do the entire project every two weeks. I make a small chunk. So we're not going to drive all the way to San Diego right now. We're just going to go a little bit down the coast. Let's go down the sleep. I'll read the list of these now. Um, so a little bit at a time. So we can make course correct. Part of that is having a good product owner from the client. Somebody you need to come to be a pain point of contact who can make decisions, who can work with you on the backlog for each sprint and help the team flesh the things out. When they say, we want the ability to pay tuition online, okay, that's great, but it's also abstract, it's ambiguous. How? What does that look like? Does that mean you put that number up there? Does that mean you break that number down? Does it mean you amalgamate it? So when you do that, the developer can say, let's break it down into these different pieces. So these are all the pieces I have to develop and build to give you that functionality. And as a product owner, you're now participating with the team through the sprint say, this is the order of things that are most important. So if there's a risk in a sprint of something not getting done, let's put that at the bottom of the list. So that when we reach the end of the sprint, if that didn't happen, the most important things did happen, we can come back and look at that. You want the interaction with the client. Again, you're helping the client response. This is very difficult. This is the model of Agile, and it assumes that clients are on board with having the product owner who is going to have the time to do that. And that's almost never the case. Very often you have to have a proxy in your own company who will act as that product owner. And very often it comes down to the project manager. I don't recommend that. That's because then the project manager has to wear two hats where he's leading the team and he's in conflict with the team. So if you can find another person who will be that advocate, sometimes an account manager is a great person to bring in as the client advocate and product owner who is helping you to reprioritize what are the, what are the business priorities in each sprint. What do they want to see completed at the end of the sprint? What do they need to see working? They want to see a homepage working with the menu. I don't have, I'm not worried about the content, I'm not worried about the slider, I'm not worried about the images, but show me a homepage that has a main menu, and bang, I can surf through the categories. The pages can be empty, but they're there. And now I can start building. One of the hazards is waterfall. Again, some of my jokes. Uh, you don't get a chance to address until the end. So many times, waterfall says, here, We've got your tree swing, and the client says, uh, I can't use that. Okay, we'll spend a little extra budget or we'll eat some profit, we'll fix it. That is not going to give you that quality goal that we had with being, and you've eaten into your profits, which is also against the other goal we started. So, um, various people here at camp will tell you they are happy with Agile or unhappy with Agile or happy with Waterfall or unhappy with Waterfall. I myself will tell you that my container is a combination of both. So you can, you can get lots of different opinions. But some of the research shows this. A third will be canceled before they're completed. If you have a chance to start with an agile process with, with a client, you're not waiting three months to, get to start making code. You're going to start within a couple of weeks. And that invests them in the process. 
we say, look, we've, we've already started making code for this. Um, at the very least, you probably get paid for that. If you're pushing papers around for three months, it's very hard to take that, which is why it's very hard to get my to agree to that the thing is going to vote down audit and discovery, which uh, discovery is something that we've realized really is the heart of everything we do after. But it's too ethereal. Like, why do I need discovery? You need to understand which works I need. Susan will tell you that she's got a project. You don't need discovery here. Here's your desk. Here's eight pages of everything you want to listen. Susan will tell you the story of, okay, we're going to do discovery anyway. Those eight pages could be more than 40 when they went into discovery because clients don't know, they don't know, and you have more experience. You need to come in as a subject matter expert for you. Half of projects in waterfall will nearly double in budget. Clients are going to work very hard to externalize that cost to you. They do not want to eat that. It's going to make them unhappy. They're going to feel the quality is low. You're going to, you're going to add noise to the relationship, to the communication process. You're not going to be able to harvest this client again. Very difficult. Then, uh, this, this is fun. More than 15% of projects are not completed, uh, only 15% only are completed on time. The software is going to have less than 10. So Susan will be happy to give you a similar set of horror story statistics on the whiteboard. I mean, on the network, um, of things that do not work. Uh, design departments will tell you design doesn't work well in the agile process. Putting design in on an agile team can be frustrating for them. Let's talk about the agile work for a little bit. So I've been alluding to this. We start with the discovery process, we start with uh, those cards on the wall. That becomes our backlog. One of the important things you really got to make sure clients understand is that backlog doesn't mean you get it. Backlog is not a static data point. A website is a living, breathing thing. The needs of a website are dynamic. The needs of your audience are dynamic. As a result, the backlog is going to change. It's going to continually grow. It's something you should talk to the client about say, we're going to put this backlog together. And at some point, we're going to cut it off. We're going to say this project only includes this. Well, this is phase one, and this is phase two, and the rest of this is going to be on your own team to develop later or maybe next year when we come back to the talk with you about it. But by then, you will have added and taken away things on this backlog. Backlog is simply a list of all the things that need to be done. If you did this to yourself at home, all the chores. I mean, if you were just brutally honest, Sweep the floor, mop the floor, clean the kitchen, mow the lawn, head the lawn, change the lawn, every single thing. I think it's overwhelming and astonishing. But that list never dies. It does not end. It is not a single data point. It is a living, breathing thing that constantly grows. Help your clients understand. This is not a promise of everything I'm going to deliver. This is an awareness of reality for you. And we're going to take a slice of it. And you're going to pay me to work on that slice for you and with you. And next year, your list is going to change. So we're going to get the backlog ready. We're going to groom it. We're going to make that selection for a sprint. We're going to remove any impediments in the way. We've got to get a server set up. We've got to get the right people connected. We've got to get permission to access the system. And then we're going to have a sprint. And this, this diagram shows sprints very much like an onion. And the idea being, waterfall says, done at the end, now it's complete. Agile says, complete package. Complete package including ingredients. Complete package including ingredients. Complete package including ingredients. ingredients. So you're building incrementally on what you built before. And again, extreme. Just think about extreme programming where it's easy to say, I'm adding to your software. So the web page is what is on it. It's a little harder. So this concept can get a little view. It's very difficult to say, this is a discrete package. The idea is that each unit at the end of the sprint is complete. And publishable, we can make it live. You don't have to. And you shouldn't think of yourself as that being part of it. But if you can make a goal, if it works, sometimes it doesn't. Make a goal of your development team say, when you're done, you'll be able to take your hands off, pass this QA, and it's ready for user acceptance and testing at this point. Uh, then you were then you're sprinting you know, very hard, very effectively. And that's why you need some new people to, to work together to realize these are the hazards, these are the roadblocks, let's solve them and get out of the way. And that's why you get the project manager out of the way. Because I insert noise in the process. 
Well, I'm sitting here between Jack and Dory trying to say, okay, you guys got to talk about this and have you done this? Have you done this? I've stopped you from working while I'm talking to you about it. Do you even handle faster? So Admiral says we're going to reverse the traditional process, where now the project manager is at the service of the team, not the other way around. This is, these are some of the steps we, we I've used before and in sprints, and these are just some some dates. Uh, I've seen sprints at four weeks, I've seen them six weeks, I've seen them two weeks. Um, Two to three weeks, I think, is pretty good. Um, not much more than a month, but you would want you know, everything to be completable within that, that, that amount of time. You can't be you know, doing it in the spring. Um, the important part is this part here in the middle. Sprint review and re retrospective and planning, notice the data is the same. To keep sprinting, to keep going, to keep your time invested in the process, you're going to very much. Finish the sprint, show them the work, get the feedback, and plan the next sprint same day, same day. Because meetings are hard. And these meetings can take hours. Some sprint planning meetings um, schedule for six hours, some up to eight hours. If you're doing full four week sprint, that planning meeting can take eight hours. That's a massive amount of time to take from a client, especially if it's more than the product owner or technical manager over three people. You kill their day with three people. And your own team as well. So make the most of this, and you want to keep the momentum. And that's how. If you, if you take that break, the you'll you'll lose that momentum. Who's who on the team? As a project manager, again, I'm I'm the person supporting the team, not leading it now. The waterfall on leading. So this again, one of the internet jokes: pig versus chicken. So pig and chicken. So say let's make a restaurant, and we'll call it ham and eggs. And Pig says, I don't know, man, you seem more supportive of the process, but I'm all in, so it doesn't work. It's, it's, you know, I'm dead. Um, in that sense, we construct teams like this. These guys on the right, those are my pigs. I'm just a chicken. And trying to remember that. And, and giving the client direct access into the planning meeting so they say, all right, now I'm talking directly to Jack. This is the guy who can be hands on on my site, putting it together, and Jack's giving me direct feedback and telling me what he thinks. And I work on that confidence, work on that communication. But also try to remember facilitate the team, facilitate production, keep production rolling. Watch, watch that that circle. As far as a, a check in, in Agile or Scrum. Uh, very much the same. The team is responsible to each other, the ECC, the people, uh, the enable handle so that you know, Jack can turn and say, You're going to need to get this done. And then you know, Corey can hand off the lead. And you don't need a project manager interfering in the process. You don't need a bunch of emails and all that. So the project manager checks in by saying, What do you need? How can I get it for you? What are the things blocking you? How can I get them out of the way? And what you asked for yesterday, did I get that for you? Did that work? Um, maybe you told me you need something and you got it. Great, it, it didn't do what you thought it was going to do. You need something else, or, it's, or there's something else that's, in, that's still in the way. Nobody knows what they don't know until you discover it. They strip everything. So you may have asked for what you thought was exactly the right thing and discovered uh, that wasn't quite right. <laughs> and you need more. So everybody, you check in. How can I get things out of the way so that the team? And do what they do, including yourself. Out of the way. Online, you'll find the the Agile episode, which includes these top four values that you're trying to build a team, and this team will get efficient. Will have the, the, the very much like there's a grieving process, you know, denial, anger, acceptance. There's a team building process, forming, storming, norming, and performing. Teams will go through this 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 part where they're arguing, they're not getting along, and it sounds like it's not going to work. That is that part where several people are getting their perceptual frames in line. Once you get through that, you start to get to the performing level. Once you reach that performing level, the amount of stuff you can do in a single sprint goes up. You have the exact same amount of time, you have the exact same people, but they are more efficient. They understand each other now. They understand how to work together, they understand their conflicts, they understand their, their strengths. 
So as you go through this process, your efficiency increases, your production decreases. That's why the, the values are in play. To, and the last value is one added by Jack Seals, who has the average efficiency in the LA. The whole point is team growth. Because the team facilitates quality product, facilitates achievement of profit. To help with that, I really recommend making a discipline out of a sprint perspective. There are four things you're going to talk about in a sprint perspective, besides, and in the story. Four things are good, bad, better, best. So, what was really good? You have a special meeting where you say, anyone can say anything politely, even if it's not popular, even if it's, you know, Paul, you drink too much beer. Uh, uh, whatever it is, and bring it in the level of conversation and try to address it if you can. Good, what was good, what was bad, what could we do better, and what was best. It's not just a bit just, it's about taking action. So you're doing this every couple of weeks. Again, part of that team building, part of the growth, part of the achievement, of momentum, part of the achievement of efficiency. Again, basic goal profit, happy clients. A happy team will get you a happy client. Thinking, this is abstract. When you look at these six, like, six ways to make a score, team satisfaction, client satisfaction, quality, schedule, scope, and progress, you're asking your team to score. You should ask your client for their score as well, twice the measure of their score. And in this meeting, you can talk about, wait a minute, I, I scored progress very high, you scored it very low. Why is it? What's, what's wrong with it? Really? So you did. You get an opportunity to raise this level of conversation. So you're talking about, okay, you're showing me that you're handing this off to me, and what this does is it uncovers what you don't know. Nobody knows what they don't know. This now gives you a chance to uncover your vision. And you say, wait a minute, my perceptual frame and your perceptual frame are not aligned. And I thought they were, but I didn't know that. So what's the difference? Now you've uncovered the gap. Expectations and reality match. So let's talk about how, where, and what needs to be done to address it. That's, that's what I've got for you. Um, any questions I can answer for you? So what would actual uh, process development not work? Um, well, pure agile people will say, oh, it'll work for this. They're even trying it in C-suite now for executive management. Uh, so I, the trends kind of go. The, from time to time, Development um, for design. If you have not designed every single page, but you simply have a design direction, you have a design team, you have a website team, and in each sprint, you started with, okay, first sprint we're going to do the home page, and we're going to do the content page. That's when you design those. Sometimes designers say, That's, there's not a lot of handoff back and forth, you know, I'm doing it, I'm done, and then there's no need for me to be in a daily meeting. The daily meeting should, should be really short, 15 minutes. Team only, not, not part of the management. So it's starting to take longer to think of the main thing. Um, listen to your team. Let them tell you. Uh, the UX guy will show up as part of the team, which I've registered the designer before. I'm like, what am I going to do? The UX design was done, the site map was done before we started. Um, how am I part of the agile process here? They're raising the same question. So you have, you have to say, okay, you're right, you're excused. You know, maybe for this part, and that may be true. You may need to have a good team of developers because you've got a complete plan. You've used the discovery to, to, to fully flesh that out already, um, or you've got a complete design. And you need to use your discovery and audit process to fully flesh that out before you start doing all the engineering and you separate that out. Um, there are some designers who are happy to sit in sprint meetings, and, and, and I said, okay, I need a web form. Sprint, so we need to design that. We need, um, we've got to do the, the three pages. We've got to do the college pages. Um, and we've already got to design a template. We've got to design a direction. Now let's set out. Just an email to design the front end guys or the end guys and the end folks. Uh, the back end guys don't know. They need to be there unless there's something else in the same sprint that interacts. So that's where you start to see the difference again between extreme programming. I'm making a computer program. Building a website, which is quasi real, it is ethereal, it exists in cyberspace, but you can see it, you can touch it. When I write a software program to balance my 
my checkbook. Put it in, put it out. There's some. I don't see it all the time. There's a way to do it. There's a there's a there's an interface in, and it's a big part of it. So making changes is much more simple. But and, and as a result, that's where this process came from. We've adapted it, and every shop will make their own version of Agile or Scrum or hybrid. Most. 
from here, we're going to have to spend another waste of time. It's not a waste of time. And that's one of the things you absolutely if you need to. You may have to say that to me. You say, guys, this has value, and if you don't see it, you're going to do it again and again until you do. Because we have to work on the communication process, we have to work on value and value, we have to work on value and filler, we have to work on value and the execution process. Because, you know, especially in smaller shops, you feel every impact, every time a company forces you to eat your profits or forces expenses back on you. And company, that's their job. Every corporation on the planet, their job is to externalize commerce. They're pushing on you as a, as a vendor, pushing on you as a, as a customer. That's the only way they stay with you. So that's part of the animal you're dealing with. And as a small shop, when cash flows are impacted, people disappear, dollars are cut. Um, you've got to get the team invested in the fact that this isn't just happening because someone asked you to do it. This is happening because this is your audience, and your ability to support this and respond to this with high quality, with high confidence, means you're continuing to laugh. And sure, you can play the game of shifting from shop to shop to shop only so long before your reputation catches up to you, um, unless, unless you remain small. There are people who can take the cracks, but you are not in an industry that is this competitive and this So, sir? I'm curious to know. You know, there's uh, so many different opinions uh, when it comes to agile and waterfall. Uh, it's ridiculous. Uh, I mean, uh, even in the academic level, PhD and yeah. beyond. So, what I'm trying to say is, it seems to me like the, the, the reason, the opinion that I've come to is that there's a misunderstanding that um, <coughs> is mathematically based. Yeah. And so, uh, what I, and they can't even agree on what software engineering is. So, I, have a real simple approach. Software exists to make life simpler, to make things uh, simpler to do. And so if you go with that, the simplicity of that, uh, I found in, in my own reading that uh, since I couldn't find anybody that would have, they would just disagree, agree to disagree. Where, um, so where I'm getting at is you have two things, right? If you're a startup and you're innovating, of course you can do different kinds of agiles, whether it's Scrum or what have you, or you can create some hybrid Agile. Uh, but if it's, which is most business, it's the same thing over and over again, then if you have, would you agree uh, to some extent on what your thoughts are on, specifically if you have an information architecture and you have the requirements that were done by someone who knows what they're doing or the team that knows what they're doing, then it seems to me like uh, the, the um, project sponsor and, and the domain expert slash user uh, don't know the difference between potato chip and computer chip, between an iPad and an iPad. They're not in a position to uh, tell you uh, this isn't good, this isn't good, and that's good. And then the iterating would be more of eye candy stuff uh, than anything else. So I'm just curious to know what you think about that. Those, those are hazards we all face. Um, and one way to address it is the user acceptance testing, is baby testing, is um, user acceptance testing has become client user acceptance testing, which is biased. Um, you want true user acceptance testing. You want to grab Joe Schmuckatelli off the street, sit down and tell me what you think of this website, and do you understand it? Do you, can you get around it? How do you, how do you make it easier? Um, and get that feedback. Use the Google Workflows. And it's, it's funny, I mean, there's, there's, the math will take you so far, but logic is not the end of wisdom is the beginning. And you have to ask, where is education bias? Is the message getting through? Are we getting the result? Are we seeing a change in the results? Or is it sort of an internal change we're making? My background is in finance and economics, and one of the things we talk about is elasticity. So elasticity is talking about for if I change the price of something by one dollar, does does the corresponding change in consumption match that relative change? And what you see is things like gasoline are inelastic. I can change the price of gas by a dollar, and the consumption level does decrease, but only by a little bit. Most people have to continue to consume the same amount of gas. So that's very inelastic. When you made a change to the website, was it inelastic? Did you see very little bang for your buck? Or was that the thing that finally broke the dam loose and wow, now I'm getting conversion, now I'm getting a buy-in, I've got a lot more hits, 
people are not bouncing off the side, they're staying in, they're getting to what they want within three clicks. I'm getting students to register, I'm getting students to send me information, or their email requesting information. Um, things like, we, that's an informational site. When I'm working on an education, if I'm Amazon, if I'm eBay, if I'm on some e commerce site, the fact that people are spending money is also related to the level of activity in the economy, the competency in the economy. So I may have buy in. People want that new computer, they don't want that new motorcycle, they want the new clothes, but they don't want to spend money right now because they're afraid of the economy. That doesn't mean your message didn't work, it doesn't mean your website didn't work, it doesn't mean it's a victim of the times. And that's the difference between. The math and wisdom. So you got to step back and say, yeah, this is what the numbers say. Back up and say, these are the numbers in what context? Um, yeah, I couldn't sell a drop of whiskey in 1922. I wonder why. Oh, yeah, it was, it was prohibition, it was illegal. No wonder all the goods sold. Well, what's the context? The math says this is a terrible business, unless you, you know, go underground and become a bootlegger and you know, go outside the law. Then it was an incredible business. So, you know, what's the kind of step back? Do the numbers make sense? Are you asking the right question? You're asking, uh, does the question make sense in, in this environment? Does the answer make sense? Why are you not getting the conversion? Either to an idea or to, to a purchase or to get information. Sometimes you're trying to get someone's content. Where is education to buy? Success, quality product, happiness. What's in the way? Where's the noise in the channel between yourself, the client, between the website, and the user that is interfering with your information? That's a great question. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know I'm going to make you start singing here in a minute? I'm going to have a question. I was thinking maybe um, don't go chasing waterfalls. <laughs> ah, <laughs> love that song. Yeah. Three part harmony. Here we go. That was great. Thank you all. I really appreciate your attendance. I love you um, Feel free to send me any questions and I'll post it down. Uh, appreciate your attendance, appreciate your attention. I hope I've uh, given you some, some good, good things and I hope I've given you some good things to buy into. Or at least to think about and, and fairly accept or fairly reject. Have a great day. Thank you for coming to camp.